Hey man, do you think you could lend me a bit of cash? Good evening everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Aika and I'm a trainee clinical psychologist at the University of Oxford. This channel is dedicated to anyone interested in psychology, mental health, psychology careers, and also for me to document my journey through the three years of the Doctorate of Clinical Psychology in the UK. As you can see from the title, today I'm going to be talking about my favourite psychology related books of 2020 and a little bit of 2019 as well. I do know that this is a book related video, but I just want to preface this by saying that I'm not actually that much of a reader. I've never really read throughout my childhood, never read throughout my teenage years. I don't think I picked up a book voluntarily until two years ago. I'm really picky with my books. If I'm not interested in a book, I just won't read it. And I also only read nonfiction pretty much. I've, I think I've read like one fiction book in the past year or so. It was Pride and Prejudice and I really knew the story. If you're not interested in anything that's non-fiction, then I just want to advise you to swipe away now because all the kind of books I have are either non-fiction or non-fiction-esque fiction. There are a few books that I won't be mentioning today simply because I've just mentioned it way too many times. It's just great books. So the first one is Love's Executioner by Irvin D. Allen. If there is a single book that I would recommend you to read is Love's Executioner. And if you want to know a bit more about it, please watch my resources video for the Declan Sai. I do talk about it um, in a more extensive way in that video. And also the same thing with Skeleton Cupboard. I highly recommend it, less so than Love's Ex Executioner, but it's still a really, really great book that I've also already covered before. Um, and loads of people have said that they've been great recommendations. All of these books that I will mention will either be written by a psychologist, written for psychologists, or philosophy related. So those are the three genres that I read my books about. I really like to know about human mind and human behaviour and human life and human existence, which is why I am touching on both philosophy and psychology because I feel like the overlap is much bigger than we think. Not in terms of academic philosophy, which is like logic and metaphysics and stuff, but actually like the practical philosophies of like uh, the old Greek philosophers, like um, Stoic philosophy that I won't talk too much about today, but I feel like there's actually a huge overlap and I would see them as the original psychologists rather than like William James or something, you know? So the first book that I'm gonna mention is the book that I've most recently read, which it, which I've mentioned already and you've seen it in my other videos if you've watched my other videos, which is 12 Rules of Life by Jordan Peterson. I really enjoyed this. I would give it an eight out of 10. It's really, really good. It's written by, if you don't already know who Jordan Peterson is, he is a Canadian psychologist who used to teach at Harvard and he is very vocal on the media scene and that's why he has a really kind of bad reputation for being, I don't know, supportive of the radical right. But I think he's a deeply misunderstood psychologist out there. 12 Rules of Life is, I mean, pretty self-explanatory to the title. Jordan Peterson basically writes about the 12 main rules he has of life. Why I like it so much and why I rate it so highly is because obviously Jordan Peterson is a very well-educated, very curious, very caring man. He has done academic work, is trained as a behaviorist, has done a lot of like scientific statistical stuff, but at the same time, he's very interested in the existential philosophers. He's very interested in Russian literature. He's very interested in religion. He's very interested in the intersections of all these kind of things. Um, and so it's like kind of a breath of fresh air to see a psychologist not just like stick into psychology, if that makes sense, and really take wisdom from um, other places as well. The biggest criticism of this book is that um, academic philosophers or academic theolo theologians actually find that his interpretations of things are kind of like off. But I don't think that really bothered me given that like I'm not an expert in those fields. And I think like I think his attitude is that as long as it's interpreted and utilized in a way that helps us live um it doesn't really matter too much like how it's interpreted which like i you know obviously lots of people would criticize that but i i think i agree i think that that's like the basis of psychology and therapeutic work it's like you know there are things that work and there are metaphors that we use that aren't like necessarily like based on evidence or whatever but um yeah I just like his attitude. The reason why I don't rate it any higher is because, as I mentioned in my second vlog, is really, really good in the beginning, 
um, especially like the prologue or the foreword by someone else. I think it captures the book really well. Um, and so that was really, really good. And also the first few chapters, but then it kind of slows down and Jordan Peterson's very tangential as a man. So uh, even if you watch like his videos or whatever, he just like, he answers a question and then like goes off tangent. It's still very valuable stuff, but like he just goes off too much. And sometimes I wonder like, has he read this book again because like sometimes i'm just like it's just going so far away from the rule that he's supposed to be addressing and also what i don't like about it is like it is ultimately although he does touch on uh buddhism and other kinds of eastern philosophy it is ultimately very eucentric and very focused on christianity and you know the values of christianity and virtues and vices and things like that which like I think he's tried, but I feel like some things were not properly understood. Totally fine with that in terms of like academic philosophy stuff, but like in terms of like literally how yin and yang, for example, he talks about yin and yang symbols, how that's like symbolized. I think like the actual factual information is just like kind of off, but at the same time, like I still stand by my like first point of like, it doesn't really matter because he's interpreted it in this way in the context of his book of like turning chaos into order. So um, eight out of 10. So the second book is um, Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankl. He is an Austrian psychiatrist slash psychotherapist in Austria, obviously. And he basically started logotherapy or um like kind of like existential psychotherapy as well and this book is really really amazing i think i rated it when i read it like nine slash nine point five out of ten i would read this book again uh but i'm just saving it like um like a movie like love Act like watching love actually like i want to like savor it and like forget it almost and to read it again and to be impacted in that way so man's search for meaning is kind of like a memoir well it is a memoir uh for the first half so victor frankl uh was a i think he was like a jewish austrian who went through the holocaust and basically majority of his family was murdered in the holocaust and he was sent to multiple concentration camps and he uses that and also he like described in great detail like the suffering that's inherent in life basically and um, the ways in which he observed how people and their attitudes and the perspectives in life made or broke them if that makes sense and um, he talks about a lot about the responsibility that a person has um, in their own lives and being able to despite suffering uh, be able to live a good life. And I really like that concept because obviously Buddhism is based on, you know, life is suffering, things like that. And I think there's a huge overlap there. Uh, the second part of the book is more about how he started logotherapy, kind of existential branch of psychotherapy, um, how that kind of developed the main components of what kind of things he likes to explore. And yeah, basically all the kind of like basic theory is very well written. He writes in very simply and very, with very simple words and like it's very non jargonistic I really, really enjoyed this book and yeah, I pretty much can't give a book 10 out of 10. So yeah, this is basically a 10 out of 10, but um, it's like a 9, 9.5. A little bit of a limitation is that he is a little bit repetitive towards the theories that he has. But other than that, it's like an easy read. It's like, you know, very not dense and yeah, it's just a good book. Third book is a recent book that I read, which is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. One of my patients um actually recommended me this book they said that it was really good so yeah after i think i didn't order it right away but i think when i saw it on like amazon i was like oh yeah like that's the book that my patient recommended me to read i would rate this 7.5 out of 10 i i think below 8 i would not read again if that makes sense i found it really really intriguing and there's a lot of evidence base matthew walker is a professor at uc berkeley he's done neuroscience uh neuroscience stuff for a really long time i think he actually trained as a doctor in the UK before he actually moved to America to do research on sleep basically. So he's very, very experienced and very um, obviously well educated in this field. I gave it slightly lower rating than the other ones simply because it is ultimately quite like focused on sleep. Um, I My own interests lie in kind of like the overlaps between kind of existential philosophy and psychology and wisdom stuff. 
so whilst this book was really interesting i don't feel like it's like changed my life another thing is that funnily enough uh, by the time I read, finished the first chapter, I fell asleep, which is really hilarious because I never take naps. And then in the middle of the book, when it went to how, just how destructive not having sleep um, will do to your body and your health and your mental health, uh, I knew that like my sleep was really disrupted by it for weeks. Like honestly, until like I finished this book, my sleep was disrupted because I was just so nervous about not getting enough sleep. So it actually did the counterintuitive thing that I wanted to do. So I wouldn't recommend this for people who struggle with sleep maybe, um, but obviously that's a huge generalization. Like just take that as a precaution that it does really go down to the nitty gritty scientific studies of how bad um, not being able to sleep does to your body and mind and everything. Uh, the initial chapters I enjoyed a lot more simply because it uh, goes through you know, REM and non-REM sleep and all the kind of like cycles and impact of caffeine on like our different kinds of like neurotransmitters and on our brain and arousal and different kind of hormones that like um, interact and go up and down throughout the day, uh, why we have a dip uh, in at like 4 p.m. Why do teens naturally want to sleep later? Differences in like the REM and non-REM sleep um, proportions throughout our developmental life. Uh, what happens with kind of amnesia or psychosis and like goes into like mental health illness and its impact on sleep and also sleep's impact on mental health. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in those topics, definitely this book is the, the thing to go to to read and he's also quite funny also at the end he talks about how you know school should be reformed because uh it's actually bad for our health to like wake up so early which is quite funny <laughs> you have to sleep at least eight hours a day that's what i learned from this book fourth book in the list is crazy like us by ethan waters ethan waters is the first non-psychologist that i'm talking about today but actually He's such an investigative journalist that it means that he um, is able to explore and express the nuances of mental health illness and conceptualization of diagnoses and mental health illness across the world. So Crazy Like Us, I would rate it a 9 slash 9.5 as well. A really, really, really good book. Like the main argument of this book is that the conceptualization that we have of mental health illness is very, very Eurocentric. Therefore, the effect of this conceptualization of mental health illness onto, which maps onto later on to diagnoses, treatment plans, even the structure of treatment or the main assumptions that we have of uh, treating certain mental health illnesses and even just like the thought of mental illness itself and like how to recover from it. All these kind of things are less rigid and it's not like having a broken leg, for example. Um, it's much more um, nuanced. And there's a lot more cultural narratives that have a much bigger effect than we think it does. The reason why that I really like this book is because actually the first chapter looks at anorexia in Hong Kong. And I think I basically, he gained his credibility through that when I read the first chapter because he describe Hong Kong so accurately. First chapter is on the rise of anorexia in Hong Kong. Chapter two is the wave that brought PTSD to Sri Lanka. Third chapter is the shifting mask of schizophrenia in Zanzibar. Chapter four is the mega marketing uh, of depression in Japan. Finally, he talks about in general, the global economic crisis and the future of mental health illnesses. I think like he's, um, his overall argument is very strong. Uh, even though it's based on anecdotal evidence, he does interview people who are, um, you know, clinical experts in their field, and the things that he talks about are quite valid arguments, if that makes sense. Even though he doesn't really touch on a lot of um, actual research evidence, um, it is a very strong book. It was actually recommended by uh, Professor Joanna McCree from UCL when I was doing my master's there. I never read it then, but then um, I think it was just mentioned so many times that I was just like, well, yeah, I'm interested in this stuff because obviously I come from a different culture. Uh, and yeah, I really, really recommend this. It's a really good book to help you think about mental illness and uh, the assumptions that we have um, in mental illness. And I wish he did it on like literally every disorder because he's just so good. So um, nine. The fifth book I'm gonna mention is written by an American clinical psychologist, but nothing related to mental health illness or psychology or anything. 
but she does use her clinical knowledge um, to write this book. So this book is about how your 20s matter a lot. She basically is an American clinical psychologist who works with a lot of what she calls 20-somethings, so basically people who's aged 20 to 30, basically. She also works with 30-somethings as well, but like on the early side, so like young, uh, early 30s. And basically throughout her clinical experience and like having worked in the field for a really long time, she's noticed that it's like a myth basically that she wants to dispel, which is the idea that 30s are the new 20s. The idea that you can like just live freely and just like, f you know, figure, um, you know, just, yeah, just live freely and be totally free of like responsibility and things like that in your 20s. And you can start at your 30s because 30s is your new 20s. So he, she's arguing against that. She like brings up like different anecdotal clinical cases that she worked with and the situations. She also delves into, I guess, the social psychology of the social history of why we have um, this conception or misconception, arguably, that of why, you know, we have this idea around like, you know, that we can somehow delay our 20s and the growth required in our 20s. She also talks about a lot about identity capital and different kinds of things that we have to build in our 20s and also things like biological clock and things like that. So she basically talks about how um, a lot of people uh, glamorize um, wasting off your 20s, uh, but actually she's seen so many cases of early 30 people who in their early 30s who've enjoyed their 20s a lot but then um ended up not enjoying it at all um when they're 30 because they have to figure out mortgages career their biological clock is ticking all this kind of jazz means that uh yeah 30s and 20s so i would rate this book um i'd say like 8.5 as well um so i would read it again and i do think that i should read it again simply because um, I think it's a really good book for an aspiring psychologist to read. Even if you're not an aspiring psychologist, if you're in a field that requires a lot of time um, to get to. So for example, if you're a training doctor or you know, you're doing something that requires sacrifices, I think this is a really good book to console you that it's worth, it will be all worth it. And that no, like we shouldn't be looking on Instagram and being jealous of other people you know, living gap years in Bali or something um, and questioning whether we've made the right choices of why we want, you know, financial security or to figure it out, to make the hard decisions early on if, in our life, basically. It's really well written, it's cool to see how American psychologists work as well. Um, yeah, recommend this for people who either need a little kick in their butt to get their stuff together uh, and get on with their lives or for people who are really working really hard in their life and questioning whether they're doing the right thing this book is great sixth book i'm going to mention is one of my favorite books i think i didn't talk about it earlier in this video simply because it's not written by a psychologist it's not written towards psychology but it's still really like changed my life and helped me like reorientate my life a little bit in 2020 so I read this actually earlier in this year I think in like January time or something and honestly like it's it's just amazing it's such a good book and it is The Constellations of Philosophy by Elaine de Bottle. Why I love this book and I probably would give this like a 9.8 out of 10 um, is Elaine de Botton is a great writer he's actually okay so he studied at Cambridge I think for like philosophy or something but actually I think he if he actually bothered, he could have been a really, really great psychologist. Um, he loves his psychology. He loves commenting about like couples, so uh, you know relationships. Um, you should definitely listen to some of his talks on YouTube um, to see his style. Um, it's very unique, and uh, yeah, he's just a really wonderful writer. And the reason why I like this book, so Constellations of Philosophy, is because it. Uh, simplifies philosophy and makes it applicable to real life. So a lot of people, like including myself, we are very um, discouraged from engaging in philosophy at all. We think that it's just some, you know, academic thing that we cannot engage in if we didn't study it and or, you know, if you didn't go to a posh school, it's not something you engage in, it's just not relevant, blah, blah, blah. it's just like abstract. This book, like, has shown me, single-handedly shown me, how important philosophy is in the current day and age. 
he basically talks about different constellations that old philosophy has given us or could give us and is why it's so still applicable in our modern day-to-day -day life. He has six chapters and it's constellations for unpopularity, constellations for not having enough money, constellations for frustration, constellations for inadequacy, constellations for a broken heart and constellations for difficulties. So I, as you can see, there's a huge reason why a psychologist like me like would love this book because it's literally about human behavior, human mind, human life. So. I would classify this as the best book of the intersection between philosophy and psychology and like kind of philosophy being therapeutic almost and yeah it's great bibliotherapy if it could be counted as that he basically doesn't talk about um obscure philosophies he talks about the main philosophers like socrates seneca Montaigne, schopenhauer um nietzsche so these main big names um i credit this book for making me be more interested in uh, the philosophy world. If you feel scared about philosophy, this is a book that will make you love philosophy. So I give this a 9.5. Closely related to that book because I love Elaine de So I have like big heroes in psychology slash philosophy. So Elaine de Botton is one of them. So other books I recommend from Elaine de Botton because I'm such a big fan is uh, Religion for Atheists, which is basically talking about the value of religion or aspects of religion that we lack in the modern world and that we basically threw away religion too quickly without actually realizing a lot of the structures that were put in place were actually really wise. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of like obscure stuff, I still think it's psychology related. Um, yeah, so Religion for Atheists is really good. He also has two other books, Essays in Love and Course, The Course of Love that follows through um, the complicated nature of real relationships. Um, and it's fiction, but he like makes like commentaries on it. And um, he just is a beautiful writer, very relatable, uh, very easy to read, uh, runs really smoothly. Uh, just really recommend any Elaine de Botton books. Sorry if I'm rambling about books. I didn't realize how much I had to say about books. I thought this would literally take like five minutes. Uh, just be like, oh, I'll show you a book. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna end with some Irvin D. Yalom books because if you followed me, thus far since like June, since I started his channel and my Instagram page, I just talk about him all the time. He's the guy who wrote Love's Executioner, which is the first book that I mentioned in this video that you should read, that I don't mention here because I've just mentioned it way too many times. Um, but uh, he has a book that's uh, The Gift of Therapy, that's really good for early career therapists. And basically his 80 something pieces of advice uh, that's like really like bitty um, to read and you can just read it, it's like quite a light read and he writes really really beautifully and really well however I didn't put this in the kind of main category because I actually didn't really enjoy this book but I feel like some people would enjoy this book I just found it a little bit too bitty and too practical and the reason why I like Irvin G. Alum is I think the opposite of like why um, the way he like integrates it into I guess the wider sphere of like existence if that makes sense. I would still recommend this book in that like um, as you can tell like I'm like halfway through I think it's just I just kind of lost interest in it because it's too bitty um, the tips don't like flow together if that makes sense it's just like you know very scattered it's really hard to engage in something that's like really scattered in this way uh but for some people it would be a great book also take it with a pinch of salt because there's a lot of things here that are like counterintuitive um so read it with a pinch of salt and also yeah think about it yourself whether you agree or not with his tips Next two of the Allen books that I would recommend, so ones I don't recommend, I'm just not gonna mention, like when Nietzsche wept and Schopenhauer's cure, because I just can't get into fiction in that way. So those are the two books if you're interested in fiction that's uh, based on existential psychotherapy, you can have a look at those books, but like I just I can't engage in that. Um, is Becoming Myself, which is his memoir. So if you're already a Irvin D. Allen fan, this is probably his last book because he's quite old right now and it's his like memoir of like basically I feel like it's like saying his goodbyes and like his like wrap up of all the books that he's written over over his years. I think it's just a really motivating book to see how psychiatrists used to work in America or you know maybe even in the UK when psychiatry and psychology had a smaller divide. It just really motivated me to see that someone can um, be so curious interdisciplinar interdisciplinarily 
um, and how hard being a doctor in America is and how he just was still interested in psychology. So uh, I would give this 7, 7.5. I wouldn't read it again because this is a memoir. And then the final Yellen book is a kind of like a textbook, but it's actually quite good. Um, it's an existential psychotherapy book. Um, it's basically covering the four existential givens of life that like Irvin D. Yellen argues, and also Victor Frankl, to be honest, which is um, freedom, uh, death, isolation, and meaninglessness, which is four existential givens that he argues almost all of us will face at some point or you know something will precipitate us to experience um and he basically writes um his clinical advice and theory and integrating philosophy and things like that so if you want to delve deeper into the interface between existential philosophy and psychotherapy then this would be a great book the chapter on death is extremely dense and he's said this before in his uh, memoir as well um, because he was still in his early career and he was like trying to impress people basically um, and also um, he was personally most bothered about the existential dread of death i haven't read the whole thing i just like read bits of it sometimes because it is really really dense and academic that's basically the end of the list of books that i really enjoyed this year hopefully i'll have time to read in 2021 as well um currently i am going to try to read the compassionate mind by paul gilbert because it was just recommended me to so many times on amazon and also recently we had a lecture on it so i think everything just coincides so i'm gonna i've decided to read it also looks like it's very not very like um, jargonistic -y, dense it's like like nicely written hopefully I will make a review on how I feel about this book on my Instagram or in later videos maybe uh, but yeah that's the books that I really enjoyed this year for people who are entertaining reading books and you know don't know why they should be or uh, feel like they should force themselves into reading books honestly don't do it I think like it's a natural process of like if you um, want some questions answered for yourself I think the books will slowly whisper to you um over the years which is what happened to me to be honest so thank you so much for joining me again hope you enjoyed let me know if you have any book recommendations for me particularly now that you have a sense of like the things that I enjoy perhaps you have any kind of recommendations for me I would love recommendations I've gotten so many good recommendations on Young which uh, I really want to delve into deeper later on um from my followers uh, who have suggested me really good like introductory um books to young if you have any other books uh related to philosophy or psychology that you really liked and really enjoyed uh please let me know um loads of people have mentioned body keeps a score which i've tried but i feel like it is a bit too intense for me um just recommend me a book in the comment section down below or if you have ever read any of the books I mentioned, let me know whether you disagree or agree to my points um, and whether you enjoyed it. And yeah, so see you next week. Bye.